is one of our uh, black survivors, and her mother, Gail. And Angela is a kidney, kidney cancer survivor. That's me. Angela is the, the nurse. That girl is a social worker. Okay, first question is for, no, not specific to anyone. Does the occurrence of cancer among African Americans have or bear any correlation to the poverty level of this group, this being blacks in general? So, um, for all the renal cell cancer, there is you know, nothing mentioned regarding about the socioeconomic class and then poor education or those like that. But uh, they just mentioned that the risk, the incidence and the risk of having the renal cell cancer is higher in the African American population. Most likely, uh, it might be related to the so chronic kidney diseases. Uh, which are the consequences of the high blood pressure, diabetes, from those being poorly taken care of, they lead to chronic kidney disease, which they have developed in progress into end stage renal disease, which finally end up in dialysis. So maybe one of the reasons for the African American population to have higher risk of uh, renal cell cancer might be from one of one of the contributing factors might be from the poorly controlled diseases, those long term high blood pressure and diabetes. Thank you. Dr. One of one of the things you see is certainly with um, the chronic kidney disease you get the development of cystic changes to the kidney, they, what we call a cystic disease and unfortunately there isn't a system in place for monitoring cysts long term in terms of being able to say should this person get an ultrasound every year or every two years or every three years but, but it's about knowing that you have uh, cysts on your kidneys not all of them will become malignant over time but certainly if you have chronic kidney disease uh, and with your kidneys will, you'll have more cysts develop and the longer you have those cysts, the more likelihood that with chronicity, those cysts will go on to become uh, cancerous and grow. How are we structured for addressing the psychiatric social needs of people with end stage renal disease who are on dialysis? I think uh, Ms. Dalska. Thank you. Uh, well, um, social workers work as part of a team with the physicians to assist the patient in understanding their disease um, and helping the family support them through the course of treatment. So to answer the question, we assist uh, screen the patient to understand are the patient clinically depressed, how is the patient feeling, uh, what are they presenting with, um, what supports are in place. So the social worker really is a support system for the patient and the family as well as bridging the gap um, with the pro providers, with the clinical team, and understanding what's going on, what's taking place, um, and is this patient prepared um, for the course of treatment? And any questions that comes up, um, assisting the patient in communicating this to the providers um, in terms of what is dialysis going to look like, um, how am I going to get there? Um, am I going to be able to afford it? Just all the day-to-day -day, uh, things that go with the disease process um, and really supporting that patient with their family. Um, sometimes patients don't have any family or support system um, and the social worker can become that support or connecting that patient to the right support. So the social worker really has a um, a key role in supporting that patient, um, and we try our best to do that. Is it easy to do in certain communities, easier than others? Um, historically, uh, 
our community really uh, does not accept um, diagnosis well. Um, and it's a lot of stigma, a lot of um, miseducation. So the social worker really, with the doctor, helps educate that patient on what's taking place and making sure that the patient's not listening to friends and family um, and that they're making clinically sound decisions based on their particular needs. Um, not that auntie or um, my cousin went through this, um, when in fact they might not have the same diagnosis and need the same treatment. The medication regimen might be different. So each patient is unique and the social worker really tries to help the patient understand that. So in our community, African American community, we really strive on educating the patient and understanding what's taking place. Um, separating the emotion behind um, what's going on and really listening to, to what's, what's taking place with that patient. So um, being African American is it's good for me because the patients are more likely to listen to me, I would say, because um, they can relate, they feel like I look like them, I come from the same um, Caribbean background, so we share a lot of commonalities, so I'm able to connect with the patient in that respect, and really getting that buy-in from the family to really listen to the providers and, and follow through on the treatment. Thank you very much. And pediatric kidneys be transplanted to adults. So long after the person is deceased, can the transplant be done? Can you speak to the rejection rate? Uh, first part of the question, yes, pediatric kidneys can be uh, used in adults. Generally, they are more often used in adults, in small adults, than at children, because pediatric nephrologists are more controlling of uh, who they, uh, the type of kidney that they want for the pediatric recipients. The idea for pediatric patients is really that you want that kidney, you want to almost assure you that that kidney would function because you don't want, uh, it's a major disappointment to a child to place a kidney and not have it work. Uh, usually pediatric kidneys may take a little while to recover. They're smaller, they're technically more challenging, they make more bleeding afterwards, so we tend to not use them in kids because of the potential issues that may follow. You never want to take a child back to the operating room. But with an adult, you would usually, um, in terms of restrict the size of the donor the recipient to the recipient, you're not going to put a one-year-old kidney into a 200-pound person. So therefore, size matters. You generally say find a small adult that would be more adequate for, for, as far as renal mass. Um, uh, the second part of the question was in terms of rejection. Yeah. yeah. Generally, we have pretty decent drugs to control rejection. We don't see a lot of uh, early rejection like we used to in the past in terms of with, but what we have to deal with more is the chronicity and the wearing out of kidneys over years in terms of getting to last longer uh, beyond that. So we do monitor through. For most centers, uh, the survival of patients is, is still greater than 95% in terms of uh, one year and five years would be 80%. So we're able to monitor patients better, we're able to treat rejection better. But we tell patients the kidneys are like cars, they can be new or they can be used. Uh, regardless of what type of car you get, you may still have issues come up that may not that may prevent the longevity. You it may not be it may not be your fault when the car is injured, so the kidney may be lost due to something beyond your, your ability. Uh, it may just be not compatible with you, and so we may struggle with some patients to get longer survival of that kidney in, in the patient. And we say just as eventually a car will wear out, your kidney will wear out, and the kidney's gonna last it forever unless you happen to have an identical twin for which you're 100% the same genetic makeup. My son, the next question, I guess, was for you, Dr. Scamper again. My son was on dialysis, and his skin turned black and scaly. Is this normal for a dialysis patient? No, not normally, but you do see dialysis patients get darker, and that's phosphorus accumulation. Phosphorus is not eliminated by the dialysis machine. It's for particularly diet. You have to take phosphorus binders 
to eliminate the phosphorus that you take in as far as your diet. You're supposed to be restricted of the foods that are high in phosphorus, and if you, but you also need to take your binders to keep your phosphorus under a certain level. So over time, if you're one of those people who um, cut corners or don't, are not as compliant, yes, the phosphorus buildup is going to be dramatic and uh, patients can change in terms of multiple shades to be severely dark based on the accumulation of phosphorus that, that accumulates in the skin. And you know, with patients, even within a few days, even after transplant, we will see some of that discoloration being uh, dramatically different. But it's a diet, you have to be compliant with your diet. Thank you. I have two questions specific to drugs. Problems of heroin, cocaine, and on the kidneys. With heroin and cocaine on the kidney. Certainly, chronic use of drugs, uh, you can get heroin necropathy very gradually over time from chronic, either heroin or cocaine. Cocaine can affect your drugs and so get affect your kidneys. And you can see patients over years who have some component of drug use. You always worry about how, about how much that plays into uh, the cause of kidney disease, but there may be other factors that combined from that perspective. Cocaine uh, is, uh, can cause uh, sudden death, which is why we see opiate uh, in terms of arrhythmias and uh, sudden, uh, sudden death as far as cardiac disease for those who use it. But certainly chronic use, drug use and property is uh, well known. And the, uh, the next question, receiving a kidney from a drug user, make the receiver test positive? Uh, no, generally in terms of uh, if the donor gets a diet a drug dose, by the time they become a donor, generally uh, that stuff is out of your system. The goal also is being transplanted kind of an organ. You're rinsing the blood out of the organ before it's used from that perspective. So there's no carryover of a high content of of uh, blood contamination or uh, drug use, drug use, presence, presence of drugs. There's a very interesting question here. How fair is the waiting list? The list is fair in a sense of, um, it, it's, uh, the list is blind to, to color uh, in terms of that. Once you're on the list, uh, depending on how big the center is, there's, there's, there's no, indicator of whether you're black or white or Chinese. Um, I may know you as a patient from that perspective. Once you're on the list, uh, end-stage kidney disease is covered by Medicare. So those patients who end up on dialysis, if you have, if you're eligible for Medicare, you get Medicare just based on the disability of chronic kidney disease. So it's not like other transplants where you have to have private insurance from that standpoint. But once you're on the list, it's a matter of Making sure you have Medicare, making sure you have an appropriate plan, uh, prescription plan to cover your medications. Uh, but generally, the question for some patients that, in terms of what the things that are not fair, is for those patients who work but work under the table, or they work and may have too much income to qualify for secondary insurance. Uh, are for a prescription plan. So there are things within the financial aspect that may make it difficult for patients to be able to afford transplantation. So certainly from, <clears throat> from that aspect of socioeconomic status and those within uh, the affordability of being able to say, yes, I can get transplanted, but I cannot afford this $1,000 a month for med medication because I don't have the right prescription coverage. Thank you very much. I wanted to um, well, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but it really is a financial um, assessment that takes place. What coverage the patient has, um, what financial resources they have, um, and, you know, there are unfortunately patients that fall within that gap that don't qualify, um, but just really like searching for what help you can find that patient, whether it's from relatives, um, churches sometimes, 
will put up and help a patient, um, which is, again, assessing what support is there and seeing what financial resources that family has. So um, it can be tricky, but you know, with the team, we try our best to get the patient what they need. Question for Ashley. What lifestyle change did you have? Did you have to take after the transplant? Um, if you want to answer that one, I want to answer one of them, please. What are some of the problems you face? What support was helpful to you? And I guess your mother could help. Yeah. Okay, so um, as far as lifestyle changes, it really was just a matter of the amount of medication I was on. I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 12, so I've been used to taking medication, but not um, the amount of pills that I have to take every day as far as anti rejection medication. So I've grown up taking insulin shots, and that was normal for me, but um, having to take, again, the anti rejection medication in the beginning was a lot because I was taking around like 18 pills a day. And uh, you know, you can't skip your medication, you have to take it every single day because in the beginning there is a very high risk for rejection, but there's also risk for rejection in general. So there's never a chance where you cannot take the medication. Um, I think that was really the main thing for me, um, the medication. And sorry, what support was helpful to you? Oh, I have a very big family and um, we support each other all the time. So. Luckily, when I did get diagnosed with um, kidney disease and I had to stop working and I had to go on dialysis, my mom and everybody else, you know, was there to support me. So I had the option of um, not having to go to work while I waited to get my transplant. And a lot of people can't do that. So I was very blessed and grateful because dialysis is hard. It's very tiring. And I worked as a stylist and running around and all the things that I was doing for hours a day is something that I can't do on dialysis, you know what I mean? So that was just really a blessing to me because like I said, I have a very big family, so everyone helped me, whether it was emotional support, financial support, or you know, if I needed anything, they were always there. Thank you very much. Also, a question for the young ones: What, what, what was her condition that led to? So you answered that one. That led to transplant. And how, how, how has it affected you? So yeah, I mentioned it before, but I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 12 years old, and um, it was very hard for me growing up because I child, you don't really want to deal with having to manage a disease. And even though I had support from my family, you know, no one is with you 24 hours a day except for yourself. And I didn't really want to have to take on the responsibility. So there were a lot of times that I didn't take very good care of myself. And as I got older, and I started to do the right things, and I started taking care of myself, the damage to my kidneys was already done. So there was, you know, no reversing that. It was only trying to move forward from there. And I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease October 2016. And it took really about a year for my condition to just progress to the point where I was at in stage renal failure. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got here. Yeah, thank you very much. And we're happy to see you looking healthy. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? In the time that you were diagnosed with kidney disease, knowing that you were going on to end stage kidney disease, was transplantation discussed as an option? So, in the beginning, it was more so just me trying to slow down the process by like with my medication and my diet. Uh, but towards the end of 2017, every time I went to the doctor, my creatinine. Um, continue to rise and basically the creatinine just lets you know how your kidneys are functioning and um, the last time I went to the doctor I think where I ended up in the hospital my creatinine was about uh, five maybe and then I ended up in the hospital in January 2018 and my creatinine was a seven and they started emergency dialysis 
So before that, I had already started the process of looking into having, um, having a kidney transplant because I knew that I saw like the pattern of every time I went to the doctor, my creatinine was just getting higher and higher. So I started making the choice of you know finding other options, and then I started looking into um, having a kidney transplant. We started off with my sister. She was originally going to be my donor, and we started the whole workup, and she was a match. But the surgeon decided that my mom should get tested because she's older. She has a longer history of you know, having good health. Also, because I have diabetes and my brother has diabetes, there's a possibility that my sister could have with diabetes. So they didn't want to you know, take away the kidney from her because she would need that. <laughs> so um, we went with my mom. Me and my mom are a perfect match. We're both both positive. So she started her work up and Transplantation as against dialysis. Um, when you look at the cost of transplantation, it's probably I think for the, the way the government looks at it is that to break even, you need success with that patient uh, for three years um, to equal the cost of dialysis uh, for for the patient in terms of the people. So certainly the long term. Beyond three years, then there's no, that's where things break even, so then the benefit for transplantation is uh, beyond three years for that patient. If you're not on dialysis, then you're going to cost the patient the government more if you're not transplanted. So uh, it certainly is, it, the long term benefit is there financially uh, for transplantation as opposed to chronic dialysis. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions pertaining to yeah. transport? Thank you. 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 Thank
How do we as individuals make a start to educate our people regarding organ tissue donation? Well, certainly the first thing we can have to do is believe in organ donation. Believe that there's a benefit to organ donation. Uh, and that some and that you can help someone. I mean the idea is for me, uh, you know, I think of all the fact that our the reality is we will deteriorate after we're dead. From dust we came into dust we will return. I mean you can put yourself in the mausoleum but you will still be dust. And so you can't take them. God doesn't want this physical body. Uh, and, you know, and so my thing is when you refuse to donate, the idea is where are you taking it? Um, and we were given a gift. We, we are a gift in, in itself. And what better way to pass on your legacy? than to allow other people to survive through that gift of giving uh, our body parts to let other people live. Um, and so my thing is from dust we came to dust we will return. If someone can use my heart, use it. If someone can use my kidneys, use it. Granted, you have to be able to be on um, life support. If you die outside the hospital, then you can still be, and you're dead, then you can still be a tissue donor. You can give lung bones, you can give skin, you can give uh, corneas, you can give ligaments, you can, uh, 75 things, things can be donated, 75 people can be saved through tissue donation in itself. So it's not just solid organs in itself. I mean, I see patients um, was given, donated blood and was talking to the tech and we were talking about donation and he didn't believe in organ donation, uh, but then he turned around and said he had cornea transplants. <laughs> <laughs> it's still someone gave them up just so you can be able to see again. Something as simple as that. So while certain things that need to be given the body to have a heartbeat, you can still help many people by skin and tissue donations. My question was, I had asked you earlier if you're a cancer survivor, if you can be a, do a donor. Um, but it, you said it depends on the Years of um, years survival beyond, beyond being okay. Years of survival, and there's some things that may not. Uh, you have to look at the risk of that cancer with late metastasis. In terms of, for instance, most people will still frown on um, if someone had breast cancer and being a donor five years later. You may you may find it hard to accept those organs because of the risk of, of transmission. It's, you may still have cells. Uh, hanging around, but if you had uh, cancer, kidney, and you knew it was confined, um, but you, and there was no evidence that our colon cancer 20 years ago, we know there's no evidence of, of, of present cancer, uh, then you can still be a donor. There are things like melanoma that no one will touch because they're late recurrences, so there are some cancers that will occur even though someone is being cured, but there's others who have been simple and cured, maybe stage one or even in side two if you have in side two. Uh, uh, inside your breast cancer, and, and it's 10 years ago, then yes, most people will still be willing to take this over. So if you are a cancer survivor that we are stage 3, and you're so that you should follow up and ask more serious questions and uh, get into um, finding yeah. out whether you can be or not. Yeah, yeah generally, I said leave it up to. If you sign your organ donor card, then the organ procurement agency will go through your history, get the records, and they'll offer it out there to see if there are any possible people who may want it. So thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I am a recipient of tissue. I had bilateral corneal transplant. So we in the Caribbean community, when I talk to people about, you know, having my vision again, because I was legally blind for many years, 
And because of the tissue donation from somebody who I never knew, have, haven't known, it's also the most unselfish thing that you could ever do. So if there's one thing that comes out of today's symposium, think really clearly and have a talk with your relatives. If this is something you really want to do, this is the best gift you could do for somebody. Dr. Scanderberry happened to be the surgeon who did surgery for my niece. Today she's, let me tell the lie, three years old, and she's doing very well. And the odds of her surviving even a six months would never have been there if there was a transplantation. So I am very, very happy that in our community we're beginning to talk about such things. My niece was like you, type 1 diabetes at 12. So it's 10 years later and she's taken her injections and the one in her chest story relate to that. That's fine. Technically we're all we're all part of that process, you know, watching her take her injections before she eats and stuff like that. So I admire you, I admire your mom. I really, really do. Now Dr. Scandalburn, I have issues with my family clearly. Um, I have a nephew that was born with not a multicystic kidney. Um, he's very fearful to this day. He's 30. He's still hanging in there, but he's very fearful of blood tests and getting his tests done. So you know, when I heard your story, I was like, I don't know what I could do to impress upon him how important it is to get his tech, his checks done. Uh, what advice can I give to him to tell him how important that process it is to, to check? It's in the sense that it's important to, if, if um, polycystic kidney disease, that some, I mean, there are those rarities, but generally about your 50s, 40, 50s, that 50s and 60s for most patients, they kidney function would deteriorate enough that they need to think about transplantation. Uh, so it's important to not be caught in that sudden failure mode, but in terms of knowing how your how your function is declining over time. So. Annually, he needs to have his uh, kidney function assessed. It's his GFR 75%, 60%, so that he knows where he is from year to year, so that he's not blindsided by, oh, yeah, sorry, but you're in stage four kidney failure. Thank you. And the last thing, I'm very, I'm very nervous about being a living donor, as most people are. But having come to this um, session, I'm happy because just like. Um, Vashti, I'm also a recipient of a corneal transplant. So somebody did for me what I need to do for someone else. I want to talk about it. Ashley, I have a question for you. Did you have any psychological support? jumping the gun, but um, I know Miss Trotman very well. I don't know if she's slated to speak later, but I would just like to hear from her about the day-to-day -day managing of your situation. You had met, you had said that you were the recipient no. of No? Okay. Um, how do you... Uh, okay. Right, a cancer survivor, okay. Um, could you tell us about the managing your day-to-day? -day? I would appreciate knowing. Well, believe it or not, in 2010, two days after our event, like this one and our luncheon, 
a prime minister, or then prime minister, was supposed to be our patron, only to find out that he was hospitalized at Columbia Presbyterian with pancreatic cancer. So we had our events, I was fine, the Sunday, I was fine. Monday morning, I got up with a very severe pain in my left side. The nurse I am, I thought I had a kidney stone, I thought I was getting a urinary tract infection. So I took all my water, I drank forevermore. Nothing happened, the pain got worse. Tuesday, I went to work again, pain was worse, went into my office for a meeting. When I stepped off the elevator, one of the supervisors said to me, Angela, you look like hell. And my response was, I felt worse than hell. I went home, I went to bed the next morning. The pain was so severe that I got up and I went to the emergency room. When I got to the emergency room at North Shore, I sat in the waiting room. I could have gone straight in, but the nurse I am, I sat until I was four. When I went in, they did an evaluation. They too thought I had a kidney stone, so they did a CAT scan, only to find out it wasn't a kidney stone, but I had a mass on my left kidney. And the doctor said to me, you have a mass and I think it's cancerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel badly at the diagnosis, but I felt very hurt at the way that it was given to me. So the tears came down my eyes when my primary doctor came in. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, don't be. She said, so you got tears. I said, the tears are not for my diagnosis, but for the way that I was given the diagnosis. Yeah. So I was admitted to the hospital. But prior to this, I had had five parathyroids removed. So I, I was worked up because they thought there was an underlying source for me to have a kidney cancer now. But they found nothing. So they did the removal of the, I had a partial nephrectomy of my left kidney, and they also removed my adrenal gland because they saw something there. Even though they said it wasn't cancerous, the person I am, I don't want you to come back two years and tell me. I have cancer of my adrenal gland, so I told them to take it out one time, which they did. Um, eight weeks recovery, and from then I've been doing pretty well. I had to be seen every three months to have sonograms done, and only in February this year, my, doc, my surgeon said to me, Angela, I don't want to see you again unless you have a problem. Unfortunately, that surgeon was supposed to be here today, but he is on call for both North Shore and LIJ, so he had to cancel. Mm. So I'm doing well, and I'm cancer-free. Yes. Actually, you mentioned you had only part of your kidney removed as opposed to the whole kidney? Yes. Because they said it was encapsulated and it was cut very early. Thank you very much, Angela. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. My buddy. <laughs> Just um, talk about my sister who had a kidney cancer. But one of the things I'm going to mention is that uh, it was years ago, probably more than 10 years. I'm not sure, but somewhere in the past, she had been told that she had a cyst on her kidney. Um, when she was diagnosed with this was another person who chronically complained of back pain for years, constantly, uh, never really had any particular anything to address that back pain until she developed diverticulitis and had a CT scan which then diagnosed her mass in her kidney, uh, only to have her doctor say to her, oh, I told you you had a cyst on your kidney a long time ago. You should have followed up. So, it becomes important to know about your health, and it becomes important to push your doctors, write things down, because she forgot that she had been told she had a cyst on her kidney. But I also say it's not her responsibility to get a sonogram unless, I mean, how can you walk into a, 
any lab or an office and say, I'm, I want to get a sonogram my kidney because I had a cyst. So it's the responsibility of the physician, but it's also the responsibility of us to know our history, to keep track of it, and to also be proactive in terms of requesting a follow-up. I always tell patients who have had, if you've had diabetes for at least 30 years and you haven't had a stress test, because diabetes and heart disease is so asymptomatic, and you may think this, uh, you may not know you've had a heart attack in the past, um, and so insurance doesn't pay for preventive testing. So my strategy, chest pain, could be anything. Could be indigestion, uh, could be missed. So whether you say you have back pain or it hurts up here, find some reason to get a test uh, and get checked. So it's the same thing with uh, your illnesses and your, your, your symptoms. Um, don't diagnose yourself. <laughs> um, things of trying to figure out what this is, um, but sometimes we have to be our own advocates and being proactive and pushing our physicians to really do the things that they need to need to get done. We may not know, so get advice from that perspective. And there's nothing wrong with second opinion either. Does age matter to transplant? And what happens if you if your body rejects? Uh, age as far as the upper limit, for our center is 75, if you're being on the kidney list and you're already on the list and you get 75, we don't take you off the list, we give you an extra year or two just to see if you're going to move up in terms of um, getting a deceased donor. We tell patients over 70 that generally if you're coming to transplant, you're going to age out if it takes six to seven years to get a, a, a deceased donor. So find a living donor. As usually we say, because you're not going to get a donor in that short space of time. Um, there are some people who I see on other centers list who are in like 80, 79, 80 who are still listed for a transplant, so different centers will have age limit. Uh, certainly, um, in terms of their those, the younger you are, uh, the goal is to have a kidney last as long as possible, but there are those who reject. While you're being followed by the center and while your kidney is deteriorating, I mean, they know you're headed down that road and they release you for a second transplant or third transplant long before you hit dialysis again because you're being monitored and you're getting your numbers. So you can get released for a second transplant or a, a repeat transplant long before the, the first one did. But if you lose it to non-compliance or you disappeared, the center wasn't following you and now you come back and you're on dialysis and you didn't take your medication, so that's another all the worms that need to be sorted out socially as to why you lost the kidney. So I'm listening to this and I think the nurses need to keep up with their patients. I do home care, so I get a closer look at the individuals. And um, we do have to keep them going back to the doctor. You know, once you're in the hospital, you think you're being cared for. But home care, when you go home, you still have to be prodded. I do visits in the home frequently. And sometimes you just have to be reminded to go to your doctor or get your checkup when it's scheduled and things like that. I have a question about medical tourism in respect to kidney transplantation. Do you see any of that? People who can afford it going abroad to countries where they have easier access to kidneys? Um, I think there was a big ring that was just washed about four years ago out of Philadelphia uh, that was um, laundering kidneys through Argentina in terms of recipients who come in, uh, donors uh, uh, selling of organs through um, people from European countries who cannot afford uh, going to Argentina as a, as a broker there and then uh, South America and then that person comes in as a relative to the United States to donate a kidney. Um, and so, yes, it's those the World Health Organization is trying to put a stop to that, but certainly um, the big push was for really to get China to not sell selling organs from prisoners who were executed uh, for um, those who were willing to buy them. And we've had patients who say, you know, I'm going to China in the last second week of November because that's when it will occur uh, from that standpoint. Uh, the issue with those is we have to debate, is, you know, how do you care for those patients after they come back? And are we obligated to care for those patients because they got transplanted on the outside and now they're back in America? Are we legally, well, you have to still take care of them. 
the issue is that there's now where there are many countries like Iran who are moving towards regulated uh, sale of kidneys. There are, there are those patients who uh, they have, a, say, an agency, and you can come in for a set price and your work to, to be a donor. Uh, and those persons who come from abroad, you're met, you meet as a, the recipient uh, and meet the donor, and it's agreed upon, and there's an exchange of funding, but it's regulated in terms of not exceeding, you know, making sure it's, it's fair and reasonable for those who are donating. So it's a regulated market from that standpoint. Uh, but overall, and the goal is to make sure that those donors are tested appropriately so that there's no transmission of, of diseases uh, where in most, most markets outside the United States, you know, what you get is what you get. Bugs and all. <laughs> Both comment about, um, about having access to your medical records. And that is that all major institutions these days, and even medical practices, private practices, have patient portals. But you can access, you can see all your records, um, including all your tests, your MRI, CT scans, etc. Um, of course, we are from a culture where we didn't have access to that, and even and don't have access to that now. I think at home now it's hard to, you know, to get your medical records to see them in, in their entirety. But I think that that's the way to monitor what's happening with your health. As to say your patient for them. I suggest that with modern technology we all have our medical record implanted with a little chip in your hand and all you have to do is slide it into a system and it reads everything out. There we go. Does anybody in, in medical engineering can work on that? A plea to the men who are here. Uh, it's important that you get your regular checkup because men don't like to go to the doctor and worst off, they don't like to have their prostate checked until it's too late. So the ladies in their lives make sure that they go and get their medical checkup for the prostate or else nothing happens. You know that. Okay? Uh, I'm a nurse. And I've seen a number of patients with prostate cancer who could have been saved. And they said, well, I don't want to mind putting a finger in my rectum. I said, well, you have a choice. Either finger in your rectum or the undertaker. Take your choice. So this is really a plea to the man. I've been getting my regular checkups now for the last 30 years. If you don't want a man put your finger in your rectum, get a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is more important. Um, I had, I was uh, got prostate cancer every five, checked every five years. And the last one I had, the doctor said to me, sent me a note, and he said, listen, you have them, but you don't find anything. I don't think you need another one in any time or so because your health seems to be quite good. I can't see anything in your system, in your test, that show you have any of it. Stemless of cancer. Does that mean that I should go back again or should I not go back again to the doctor to get a check? And oh, no. No, I should not go back. Or no, I should go back. <laughs> unless, your, unless your physician has a direct communication with God, you know what's going to happen with you in the future. Go back. Go back. Grab me my bed.